From the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing at The Ohio State University, this is Writer's Talk. I'm Doug Dangler. Lisa Scottolini is the New York Times bestselling author of 16 novels and two books of essays. She writes a weekly column called Chick Wit for the Philadelphia Inquirer. She has won many honors and awards, notably the Edgar Award given for excellence in crime fiction. She also teaches at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where she received a BA in English and a law degree. Francesca Scottolini Saratella, Lisa's daughter, contributes columns of her own to the Chick Wit series and essays in her, their most recent collection, My Nest Isn't Empty, It Just Has More Closet Space. Lisa graduated from Harvard University, where she received the Charles Edmund Horman Prize and the Baron Russell Briggs Prize for her creative writing. She has also won the Thomas Temple Hoops Prize for her senior thesis, a novella. Welcome to Writer's Talk, Lisa and Francesca. Hi, thank you for having us. This sure. is really fun. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm glad you're here. And uh, that's a, a very long introduction with a number of prizes. Oh, you're very kind. Well, we, uh, just so we know, too, she's the one that went to Harvard. Right. I'm not as, that smart. Well, you went to. <laughs> I'm a uh, nice person, but I'm not as smart. You went to as University as of Pennsylvania Law yeah, you School. Know, it ain't bad. It yeah, ain't bad, but, it, but you it's know, not Harvard. I can't <laughs> claim the Harvard part. <clears throat> that's too bad. So do you make fun of her uh, in oh, print so a lot? Sad. I haven't. I haven't read. I didn't read that in here. That you're making fun of her. No, it wasn't any disrespect to University of Pennsylvania. I just had to get away from home. <laughs> How dare yeah, you? Yeah. Well, fortunately, you didn't disrespect uh, Pennsylvania. You did you disrespected your mom? Yeah, so that's, which is a great American that's tradition allowed. too. Right. Great. All right. So anyway, um, a family of overachievers. You graduated magna cum laude. <laughs> Right? In three years? You graduated. I did. You did, sorry. Um, and uh, your concentration was contemporary American fiction, taught yes. by Philip Roth yes. and others. Yes. Crazy. But then you went to the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Right. Tell me, I mean, as an author looking back, what made you do that? Well, I think, you know, I went originally because of Perry Mason. It's, it's, I know. Yeah. You impressed yet? <laughs> I wanted you to went, be Perry Mason. I didn't know he was there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, sadly. sadly okay. And I, uh, it was, I just always thought it was really interesting and dramatic. Mm -hmm. But it really, and I loved being a lawyer, I was a trial lawyer, but when she was born, um, and I sort of got divorced at the same time, let's not yep. recommend that to the viewers, Okay. Um, I really thought that I wanted to change my life to stay home and raise her, and that's when I thought, you know, you always wanted to be a writer, mm -hmm. you can't get any more broke than you are now, you might as well start. Okay, good. So that's the pathway you're yeah. recommending, is go out yeah, and- divorce and failure. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think I can get half of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, is there uh, another academic degree in your future after having just graduated? Are you thinking, I read on one place you said you were, um, in rebellion against your mom, you thought about going into veterinarian school, <laughs> yes. right? Yes, when I was in high school, I was so sure, you know, I'm not gonna be a writer, I'm going to be a vet. And I love animals and was okay at science, so it seemed possible until I realized just how icky blood is. <laughs> I have to dissect them. Wait a minute, you're Forget the daughter of, a, of a, somebody who's won a, for crime novels and you find right. blood icky. A little bit. I'm light on the autopsy <laughs> stuff. I leave that to people like Patricia Cornwell. Okay. I, I do like read about it, but to actually be tearing them apart, that's quite a difference. So. Okay. So girl. you won't commit murder, uh, either of you. If you do, it's going to be through poison or something right, like right. that. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think my books anyway, you know, as you know, as, as a writer and someone who's looking a lot at novels, I don't really think in terms of genre anyway. Okay. Um, so they say they're crime novels. I don't think they are. Uh, I think they're stories about women who lead interesting lives and get themselves okay. in trouble, have to get themselves out again. So I actually steer clear of all the goopy stuff. I don't, I'm not into it. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about uh, the uh, the writing that you do together or you work for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you trade back and forth sometimes writing this column. We do. You're writing from the viewpoint of the mom. You're writing from the viewpoint of the daughter, now I'm living in a different city, right. and tormenting your mom <laughs> by, uh, at least in, in one of the, the essays in here, one of the essays you wrote, um, going out and not telling your mom where you'd gone, Oh, which is just cruel. Oh, see, tell that me is. about that. Thank you. You're already writing the song on your side now. In a way <laughs> that it wasn't true. It wasn't that I didn't tell her. In fact, we had an entire conversation about, you know, street smarts and safety. I was going on a date with a very nice gentleman, a lawyer mm -hmm. that I had met. Wait you a think gentleman, lawyer, right? same thing? How oh, dare sorry. you? Go ahead. How dare you? <laughs> yeah. She's just preaching to the choir. So I told her all about, we talked about, you know, meet him at the restaurant, don't, you know, go back home mm -hmm. alone, don't let him know where you live. What I didn't do was call and check in with her at multiple points during the date. Mm. Yeah. And that apparently was cruel. Back right. I just didn't realize. Right, yeah. <laughs> I just back around. I, just I, I, I read something conservative uh, estimate: twenty phone calls and fifty-eight texts. 
Within that's a one misrepresentation. Hour. Representation. And you forget to email my roommate too. Oh, she emailed your roommate. Oh, what? That's right. And this was all before even two in the morning. It wasn't like I was out. Yeah, but this is all this is all in the book already. So I'm not releasing any information. It's on the record. It's on the record that you did this to your mom. I plead guilty. Okay. Well, it's sort of funny because when you think about how these these books evolved. Um, the column started when I went to the Inquirer and said, mm -hmm. listen, well, actually what I said was I miss Irma Bombeck. Mm -hmm. And I thought there was a lot of, um, obviously it's tough times, but the newspapers are always full of bad news anyway. I thought we need something funny in this news. We need, because mm -hmm. I think back to Russell Breaker or let, think of the more political columnists, Royco. Um, I used to, I grew up reading those guys and Irma Bombeck was one. And I said, can I do that? Will you let me do this? And I wrote so much about my family life, which includes her, that people said, you know, why don't you let her tell her side of the story and shut up for a change? <laughs> and that's actually what had happened. That sort of, sort of evolved into the books. Okay. So how often do you get to tell yours? And most of these are your essays in, in this most recent book. Right. But you have, right. uh, it says, contributed some essays. As far as the column goes, I usually contribute about once a month. Mm -hmm. And um, as these we continue with the, write these books, I might be able to contribute more, and I would love to. But mm -hmm. it's great. It's just it's really nice to have a project that we can collaborate on. But she's kind enough to give me my own space to have my own voice, develop it. Uh, I get to write them, you know, in New York. So it's mm -hmm. nice we can work together, but not necessarily crowd each right. other. And yeah. you describe it as um, you don't you you don't. Off, uh, edit each other's work. No, right. um, and you just whatever goes in goes into the column. Right. So yeah. that so um, have you worked on something where you did do that and it seemed seemed to be difficult or you've just always no, said you have, have your own space. Uh, we never have. I mean, I sort of first off, I, I I think she's enormously talented and I really like to encourage. Well, she's my daughter and I really right. want her to develop her own voice as a parent. I feel that way. Mm -hmm. But I think it's true, you know, people who are listening or watching now, I really do think that everyone has a book in them and everyone has a voice that they need to find. So uh, m the, my approach to this whole thing has been trust her, let her develop it herself. It, she sends it in, it's her byline and mm -hmm. they're great. Okay. I don't think... Um, so there isn't a time you've had a fight and she has a column due. And you think, boy, I don't know. No, I'm kidding. No, she never has to worry about it. me as far as <laughs> deadlines. But I, I do. I mean, it was a conscious decision. Certainly, in, you know, high school, just growing up, she would help me, and and of course, you have that normal parent-daughter friction. But mm -hmm. I, I think that's something. That's why I made that choice to not have her edit me, because I think you can always find a critic, and you really you only get one mom. And mm -hmm. I have a terrific one, and so I try to protect her in that role. I do. <laughs> as a I'm really going to need some more friction here. You know? <laughs> I know, as you know, as a you? novelist, you know drama. <laughs> I know drama. We have so drama everywhere else. Okay. I'm not. We're girls. We're girls. <laughs> we had drama getting ready for this interview. We had to get ready. You know, I mean, like. Well, you sort of coordinated. Out. You came very close to OSU's colors. I, with scarlet what? and that gray, this is blue. Point. I think I'm slightly colorblind. <laughs> if I'm right, if we do the color corrections yeah, right, slate, slateish. Uh, but you, 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 we, you we came we well prepared. We did actually think that on the way over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good, good, good. Guys. Um, so tell me about uh, you talk about allowing her to helping her to develop her voice. I'm interested in the way that you created your voice within your fiction. How uh, you worked through that to yeah. come to something like that. Well, as a I writer. mean, I, I've done 17 novels now, now writing a memoir. You sort of see that there isn't really much of a difference. And it's funny how it sort of proceeds almost naturally from the discussion about her. And mm -hmm. maybe something that would help your, your viewers and listeners. Because I really think that the key to developing your own voice is getting out of your own way. You know, so I kind of got out of her way. And my own process. I mean, you, you talk to lots of writers. Most of us, I think, are deeply insecure. At least the ones I like are insecure. The, the secure ones are full of themselves. But the who are the the, the real secure ones. Oh, okay. They never I really there was like a specific I, name. Or oh, there, there is, but there. we can't say on that. No, we can. <laughs> no, we can. <laughs> not my problem. Go ahead. But I sort of like. Um, I think the development of voice is so allied to the development of identity as an adult, and also changes over time. And part of it, I find at home. When I'm writing and we're all alone, I'm just looking at that computer screen going, um, just keep the negative voices at bay, get out of your own way, and just write it down. My mantra, and I've told it to her and so she knows this is all true, is like, get it down, then get it good. Mm -hmm. And that's how I think you find your voice. You just get it down relentlessly, and I'm talking over years, and you start to let yourself emerge. What does that look like for you in a day of writing? What does that look like for when you're getting it down? You sit, how do you go through your day? How do you get it down? Well, you, this is where you find out how dull my life is. And I basically work all the time. I work a lot. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I started about eight in the morning, and I have a big coffee from Dunkin' Donuts, and I um, just try to get out of my own way and tell a story. I don't outline anything. Um, I just start with the premise and go, and that's for a full. So you write completely linearly. You're not. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. if I think there's a flashback, and I've done novels where there's been flashbacks, mm -hmm. I um, will just put that in then. I don't plan anything out. Okay. Impressive, huh? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that is. That's cool a, in here that will say it more. Uh, <laughs> she well, outlines a little more than I do. I mean, she, you do t a little more planning. Yeah, I think the process is probably in, in very individual. But yeah, I do some sort of. If, I, I almost think of just meditations on the characters, the plots, right? things I want to include in themes. I have a, a little note page to write that all out so that I don't put it so explicitly and heavy handedly in the actual writing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I work with word count goals a day, and that helps me um, just to make sure that I get something down. Just like she's saying, you can judge yourself so harshly that you get a little bollocked up mm -hmm. and really don't get anything on the page. So the word count goals help me to just make a progress that at least I have something I can look at at the end of the day and move on forward. What's with. your standard word count? I try to do 1,000 to 2,000 words a day, and so I ramp up. And when I'm starting, I, don't, I feel less confident. There feels like there's decisions to be made on every paragraph. Mm -hmm. You know, what is this character like? I don't know yet. I don't know them. Mm -hmm. So and then I'm usually sh shorter, more close to 1,000. But when I'm in the thick of it and I feel like I know the characters and I can just sort of put them in something, a situation, and they do it themselves, sometimes I can get up to two. She's awesome. She can do... Well, like, I mean, I, I try to do two, 2,000 as well, and mm -hmm. I don't, um, I'm always nervous till I get a first draft down, because, you know, people say, do you know how it ends? I don't know how it middles. I don't know anything. <laughs> I know. Great, huh? Never heard that used don't as a verb tell before. Don't tell me. Well, I, you know, and who, right? We can make this stuff up. Mm -hmm. um, but. Well, I, you I, can make this up. You've got <laughs> 17 novels. I can't make this stuff up. I mean. Yes, you can. <clears throat> Yeah, okay. So tell me, what? Uh, why do you enjoy, or you enjoy legal fiction? Tell me about the writers that you admire. I mean, well, you know, who I else are you? I mean, legal fiction, like, that's another thing. I don't really, actually, I don't like a lot of legal fiction. How about the genre of women who get in trouble and need to I get know, out? I know, and I am what? it. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, sometimes legal fiction, legal novels are, okay. can be very boring. So I don't really like that. Mm -hmm. I, t I read really widely. I like thrillers. Um, and I also like memoir. Um, I think anybody, Stephen King has a great quote about if you're, you know, anybody who presumes to write and doesn't read first is a fool. So I should mm -hmm. always say to myself, if I'm not writing something, I ought to be reading something good for me. It doesn't mean that it's boring, because I actually don't, I think that's bad fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of my view. I always divide whether any kind of writing okay. um, into good and bad. If it's good, it works. If it doesn't work, it's bad. I okay. don't, what is about, that the question? What about for you? That no, like that's it. sort of the question. I mean, it's getting. I'm going to come back to I it. Kind of sucked <laughs> it. <back>. The, uh, <laughs> but what about for you? Who who do you read, and what are you looking for? Um, your mom's talking about the divide between good and bad, which is, I'm thinking subjective. Yes. Um, and, but what defines that? I mean, who do you read? What defines yeah. that? How does that work for you? Well, I mean, I also try to read very widely. I'm fascinated by families, so I also like memoir. I have a weird affection for addiction memoir, even though I've never been addicted to anything, mm -hmm. simply because I think it frequently you get to see the seeds of this person's inner demons in their childhood or in their families, and then it becomes so exaggerated by this the dire stakes of any uh, that addiction brings, unfortunately. But So I'm interested in that. As far as fiction, I read so many different genres, but mm -hmm. what I, the type of writing I admire most and I aspire to is sort of probably skews towards the sparse type of prose that really can pack a punch quickly. Um, just I remember studying uh, the short stories of Graham Greene, and I hadn't even really been such a disciple of his in the novels. When I read these short stories, they were so remarkable. Many of them are as short as five pages, some are longer, mm -hmm. but he does not, it just such, packs a punch. There's so much emotion and so much control of the reader and that perspective in these very simple prose, simple storytelling, and that's really what I admire most and what I think I enjoy reading the most. Okay. Does that spark for you? Well, I'm thinking about what's the definition of good, because um, I, I heard You're the one that used the term. I know, and you know what I think is not a bad definition? And somebody said it the other day, and I thought, um, it was a reader, because we're on book tour. And, you know, so that's what's cool about it also, because she said, the kind of book that it's always on my mind, I can't wait to get, you can't wait to get back to it. That's a book that's working. And we can talk, and I'm happy to, about the myriad of decisions that somebody's making about plot, character setting, voice. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things that work together seamlessly, and they should be seamless, to make somebody go, 
I don't know why I'm liking this book, but I can't wait to get back to my purse where the book is, and I hope the train's late, and I hope she's <laughs> late getting, and I hope everything's late so I can just sit and read. Okay. I hope she doesn't call. Yeah. I hope I sit get home in the wondering. Way. I know. Yeah, what's going on? Um, okay. So you write a, in your essays about being fifty year old, fifty mm. years old. Fifty five. Okay. And <laughs> full disclosure. It, I was just going to say fifty. And the <laughs> decades lesson of asking for what you want. Okay. Right. And I quote. Yes. At six fifteen in the morning, a handsome young man <laughs> arrived at my hotel room and blow dried my hair. Honest to God, it was all I wanted from him, <laughs> and that's what being fifty is all about. <laughs> So tell me about, you know, you... you why did you pick the most, why did you pick all the heartfelt, moving... Uh, well, it's not a heartfelt moving show. show. <laughs> the, the, um, we're, we're, we're in for the, uh, the, the light. Wait. No, I, <laughs> that is interesting because, you know, it, in a joking way, is right. bringing up a lot of serious things, right. actually. Right! So... <laughs> he gets me! I'm, I might be in love with you. <laughs> uh, I get that so often. <laughs> You're the first author. The... Um, but the question I have on something like that is, there's a lot of stuff in here that, I mean, you talk about um, finding a gray chin hair. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that are, you know, how do you, I'm not looking. How <laughs> do you, you know, where do you draw the line? Um, right. What is the line for you? What, uh, and I'm not asking you to dish on, on things that are over the line, but there are times you think, oh, do I really no want line. to write about this? No line. Oh. <laughs> no line. So, I mean, okay. and, you know, I mean, I, I think, I mean, you're right, because, I mean, I, it's funny, that's its point, but you're, I think um, I always have that great Francis Ford Coppola quote, and he said something like, uh, "You know, nothing in my movies ever happened, but all of it is true." And and anybody who writes fiction, and anybody who writes nonfiction, we're all trying to write something true. Now, unless I bust myself, unless I, you know, if I talk about getting a gray hair in my head, you've read that before, you've mm -hmm. heard that before. You go, "Who cares?" And the point about these essays is that they're funny, and I think they're universal and they're true. So I have to really tell something that's going to make me cringe and going to make, but you know, that's the stuff that, mm -hmm. what, you know, we'll get the email about or we'll see people at signings go, God, I remember the day I found a hair on my chin and it was great. And you want to <laughs> shoot yourself twice. <laughs> and, and that's a true thing. You as the author want to shoot yourself Yo, twice? Totally or, you or, do. Or, why, why twice? Because it's, it's so horrible that it's not bad enough for growing hair, but that it's gray. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you, you meant because I'm some. Saying? Right, because I thought you meant because someone had written into you, and that made no. you feel okay. No, so no, I feel great that. when people share my pain. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, but you're you're choosing not at this point to go that route. Presumably, I uh, just don't have any gray hairs on my chin. chin. Well, <laughs> I was going to say that, but I didn't. Want, but so. What what kind of influence do you feel that your mom has on sort of to your well, writing and I think that I it? have taken from her the importance of being vulnerable and forcing yourself to be vulnerable in your writing. So even though um, maybe I don't have the same gripes as my mother, I have written a column about you know my grand gesture of love. I went you know jumped two planes to visit an ex-boyfriend and I was dumped, I was rejected. And I write about that because that happens. It doesn't, sometimes you make mm -hmm. the big play and it doesn't work out. And that's okay and I got such lovely, lovely email because if that's happened to me, girl, you'll find somebody. <laughs> it's so nice to get a of support, but that's not why I did it. it was the, I mean, I do it because I think exactly what she said, you have to be real, you have to share of yourself. That's sort of the, the difference in fiction. You can share of yourself, but in this very veiled way where uh, difficult things happen to your characters, you can put them through the ringer. For you, you have to mine yourself, you know, what is that mm -hmm. source of honesty there. And I've often wondered when people switch between fiction and nonfiction, you're talking about, you've got to put your characters through that ringer. Yeah. Um, there Are there times when, especially if you're writing women who get into trouble, mm -hmm. you think, oh, geez, I don't want to do that to this character, but you end up doing it anyway. And well, how hard is that? You know, you're I mean, like, not to get all woo-woo on you, but the character does it to herself. You know, so yeah, at the point when I started to realize that when they say the character mm -hmm. and plot are the same thing, like I have to learn stuff myself, and I finally figured that out. Because if you don't know what's going to happen in the story, the character's going to do something, and that will, of necessity, advance the plot. And also then people will start calling it character-driven in reviews, which they think is a really good thing, and I guess it is. But the truth is, the character did, and I go, it's just like your life. You know, we are what we do, and that is sometimes revealed in real time, you know? Mm -hmm. You find out, wow, my husband cheated, or wow, my wife d took all the money out of the bank account. That's what she is, now I know. And that does seem to, um, to a certain extent, happen serendipitously. Okay, when you say serendipitously, 
that's probably the wrong word. I'm curious about and that I because barely could exp I could barely pronounce it. It came uh, right yeah. out. It, it was beautiful oh, the way you did it. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, I, because what I was sitting here thinking is, as you're discussing that, I think, well, how often does it happen that you've you've got this and you realize that the characters are are doing things that, as the author, you think, oh, I'd like to do this, or I find this kind of thing fascinating, and then after you re you read it afterwards, you think, okay, I'm playing back something else. I'm playing some part of my life that that is, uh, it, it's transmuted in some way. I think it's always a part of your life. You're always saying, because the question is always, what would I do? Because mm -hmm. I think the key about my novels, and about Nest as well, is that they're very relatable. So it's never something that, while you might not do it, you can understand someone doing it. Mm -hmm. Most of the times, I would do it. They're all, all my characters are always some aspect of me, which doesn't, I hope that doesn't sound egotistical. It's just sort of like, it's just that I'm such an open book. I, I plumb myself to go, wow, who is this woman? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why people like her, because she's kind of like them. The whole point of Nest, the whole point of everything we write, is that it isn't about us. It's about women. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder about your arrest record, since you're <laughs> writing a lot of women get into trouble, as you I know, say. I know, I don't always like when they break and enter. But <laughs> Sometimes a little B&E is, all girls got to do a little B&E <laughs> That's the quote for today. Um, tell me about uh, your mom is a big part of, uh, your mom, your grandmother, is right. a big part of your writing. Mother right. Mary, uh, Mother Maria. Um, <laughs> tell me about, uh, she sometimes accompanies you on book tours. You've also said, I think she's, she's 70 and says uh, you can be a prima donna at 70, I think is she's the quote. A, she's 86 86, now. sorry. <laughs> How do you know? Oh, yeah. so, so what do you, you know when when she's accompanying you? Um, and she also seems like she has uh, a bit more of the critic side because whereas you two don't critique each other, she has sent you critiques. <laughs> right? Yes, well, she's big on um, you know grammatical. Er, ain't is not a word in her right. in her lexicon. So <laughs> well, even I have a, ain't in a dialogue of somebody, mm -hmm. which as we know, you're trying to embellish character and mm -hmm. flesh it out and inform it. She'll say ain't isn't a word, and my daughter should not use ain't because she went to college. But it's great. But again, it's great right. because we get a lot of email about her. Just how, because a lot of people, again, it's not about her. It's about their own mothers mm -hmm. and that generation. And it ends up being, in a funny way, I hope, uh, you know, sort of as you say, meditations on what are three generations of really feisty women about, okay. and how are we like, and how are we different, and okay. why. All right. Speaking of three generations, one of the things you have in common is pets. <laughs> you have that's one true. dog in New York, which is like 20 in Ohio. Um, <laughs> I think that's the exchange rate when you're living in New York. Uh, so you've got four, uh -huh. I think, um, cats. And two cats. And uh, there, there, I think there are There's some other. There's a pony and a horse. Okay, a pony and, and a horse. And chickens. chickens. The, right. chickens. the chickens were what I had been alerted to, that you were keeping <laughs> chickens. Awesome. So what is this attraction, um, do you think, for the, the, the two of you and, and all the pets? Uh, and, and why isn't it more obvious in the fiction? Well, why I, aren't there I chickens always, getting into I trouble? Know, I know, I <laughs> know. Chicken in peril. It's a new genre. Um, well, for me, the, it started when I started to notice that uh, people ha were getting multiple dogs and also multiple divorces. And I started <laughs> to wonder, because everybody used to get like, divorced once and now divorced twice, three times. And then <laughs> people have three and four dogs. And I'm like, are these things related? Like, are mm -hmm. you trading in your husband for a dog? And actually, I think what's sort of happening a little bit is as women get older and get dateless, just speaking hypothetically, of course, <laughs> not in my own case, right, yeah, okay. she's incredibly social, right. that you find yourself buying love with fur, <laughs> and the, my conclusion is there's nothing wrong with that. Which is right. why you've got, a, a, I think, a book called My Next Husband Will Be a Dog, yes, isn't that? Yes, there you go. And there's a mug, probably, that goes along with it. <laughs> I've should seen be. this mug. It doesn't have to be divorced, though. It can be. B dogs are wonderful band-aids. You know, you've heard of band-aid babies. That's not a good thing to do in your relationship. But they're great when they're just a dog. When I went to college, she got a dog. She said she was going to name it after me. <laughs> Did but that end up happening? I had a place no, with like I, three dogs. Oh, okay. I well, know. That's, that's the exchange rate. rate. Right. That's the exchange rate for children, that's three nice dogs. That's to know. I have one dog and two children, so apparently I'm doing something wrong. Fine. Just wait until they go to college. And you're probably married We're to the same person. Yeah. Well, there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah. Like get personal on the thing. <laughs> <laughs> not even divorced. We're not here to talk so about me. We're, <laughs> we're not here to talk about me. Um, you also received uh, the Fun and Fearless Female Award from Cosmopolitan Magazine. I know. That was so fun. So, what's that about? How did I'm this come about? How does an author things. get Fun and Fearless Award from Cosmopolitan? Well, I think um, people. I'm going to avoid all the obvious because it's such a good straight line. But uh, the truth is, I, uh, I think that they just like that I'm portraying independent women in the books. Okay. 
Okay. I cleaned that up nice. Didn't yeah, I? you did, and it sort of left me hanging. There. I know. That's I, all I, that I, I was hoping there'd be more about something uh, that happened at a author's retreat, a book signing. No, you know? no, no, no. They no. just found the books. Okay. <laughs> she can't hold her cosmos. <laughs> right. Ah, uh, because Lightning. the magazine keeps dropping. Is that <laughs> it? The can hold her drops. Ah, right. magazine. Um, you also teach a, 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 a course at the University of Phil Pennsylvania law school mm -hmm. called Justice and Fiction. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the course content. Well, I developed it. It was one of these things, again, where I go and I said, you guys need, um, because I think a lot, there's themes on my book about, well, if you want to say in crime fiction and mystery, I like the great themes. Go back to, you know, crime and punishment. Look at me. Oh, yeah, wow. right. Nice. That's nasty. That's me. <laughs> We're like this. Yeah. Um, right and wrong, good and evil, justice and injustice. You know, murder is like, the, that. It, it's all encompassing. And I started to more and more think about fiction. I mean, I've been writing for 20 years now, so it's practically, you know, Jurassic anyway. And you, I started to look at it, and I said, these law students should understand that fiction about justice uh, grows in a social context. So, so it sort of grows out of the civil rights movement, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, post-Miranda, um, the Godfather. You know, there's a reason when everything turns topsy turvy in the law, it turns topsy turvy in fiction, and there's and it's not a coincidence. The Godfather is written after that upheaval in the criminal justice system, because the crooks, the crooks are the the main the stars, right? We're all in love with Al Pacino for a reason, because he's <laughs> Italian. But that's the course. Okay. All right. And you haven't taken this course yet, though. No, but I have attended. Oh. I was sort of a mole, like I was a plant. Nobody knew I wasn't a real student. I That's went true. one day, mm -hmm. and it was fun because I got to watch people, you know, on AOL Instant Messenger, like talking to their friends. And I, I was know. like, hey, this is my mom's course <laughs> because she is such a nice professor. She lets them call her Professor Lisa, and she lets them call well, her. I don't I have like actually, yeah, I can't yeah, I like really. I'm not. I'm not a junk, you know. <laughs> not the real deal. And she, for, wait for this. How many people were in your class? 120 20. about in a lecture. She has no teaching assistants. She does it by herself. She would bring a little brown paper baggie with an apple and a Snickers bar for every single student. I packed them with her for every single student for every single class so that they would have something healthy and sweet mm -hmm. to have okay. during the lecture. Okay, for when their fingers got tired right. of the text and <laughs> during the middle of it, they could no, eat it an apple. No, we did. They okay. really enjoyed the class. Just, the okay. class was from 4 to 6.30, so they would be having dinner. There would be dinner time. I'm not going to sit in front of starving 120 <laughs> kids. 20, they could go cannibal at any moment. Yeah, just, well, right. they're lawyers, after all. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you, <laughs> Lisa and Francesca Scottolini for being here today on Writer's Talk. Thank you so Thank much. You. This was fun. Great. I'm <laughs> glad. And from the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing at The Ohio State University, this is Doug Dangler saying, keep writing.